So each project in Novella is very different. It's addressing its own questions and it's using its own methodology. But what brings them together is that they're all concerned to answer the same theoretical questions and also to address some methodological issues in common. So the theoretical issues are to do with understanding the way in which families talk about their identities, their practices and their values and how different members of the family negotiate those and methodologically we're concerned to understand the way in which it's possible to reuse data, material collected for one study in another and particularly qualitative data, but how we can also link those data across studies with other material and sometimes quantitative material too. So each study provides a different insight into those issues. Bringing them together means that we have more than the sum of the parts. Well, our project is um, taking a fresh look at two existing data sets. These data sets, one was a project called Fatherhood Over the Generations that included a group of Irish migrants. And the second project was called Transforming Experiences that included a group of Afro-Caribbean migrants. And the purpose of the project was to bring these two data sets into conversation with each other and to look at the ways in which people tell their stories and make sense of their lives, rather than only to look at how they lived their lives and what happened to them. What we did was to match um, cases across the two data sets to kind of compare their experiences and the way they talked about and recounted and remembered the experience of migration. I thought the best way to make sure I got off at the right stop, I would count the bus stops, you know, and that way I would get off at the right place. But I didn't count the traffic lights, did I? Every time the bus stopped, you know, at the traffic light, I counted it as a stop. So, of course, I got off far too early, you know, right at Camden Town Underground Station, you know. Hadn't got a clue where I was, you know. I was completely lost. I went in and had a look around the station and, and I could see these escalators coming up and down. The noise, oh, and it scared the life out of me, didn't it? I'd never seen an escalator in my life, you know. But anyway, I got back on the bus and I went on a bit further and eventually I got there. But it really was frightening, you know. It was. Traffic lights was completely new to me because I'd never seen any traffic lights until I came to London. Thinking about how the, how the past um, is remembered in the, in, in the present and thinking about the relevance for understanding contemporary family life and understanding um, migration, we can kind of think about how over the life course strategies say to counter discrimination are, are experienced, how historical events um, play out in individual lives, for example, the difficulty and discriminatory practices around finding housing in the 1960s made it very difficult to, um, to form new families and to have any kind of family life. In present um, day debate around migration, there's a real turn towards the personal narrative of the, the successful or the problematic migrant and actually to be able to take narratives over the life course of real people and to show the kind of complexity um, of the life that they've built and the challenges involved of that is really valuable. One is never done with data. You know, there are new ways of interpreting it, which doesn't mean to say that the, the way you made sense of it before is invalid, but it extends the interpretation. The project's called Food and Families in Hard Times, Methodological Innovations. 
um, and it's about using narrative archival research to get at the food practices of families living in difficult times in different historical periods. Using different sorts of archival material, written diary material or oral history interview data and visual data, so cookery books, photographs. The analysis has been challenging but it's also shed light on people's lives throughout these historical periods, for example in post-war Britain and during the First World War. And we've been looking at data where food hasn't necessarily been asked directly and uh, information about food practices has emerged more spontaneously in these diaries and interviews and photographs. So first of all we visited the Mass Observation Archive which is based at the University of Sussex and we've been looking at diaries and directives from 1950 to 51. Some of the diarists, and Nella Last is one of the most famous diarists, wrote in detail about the meals she made for her husband. She did voluntary work during the war, she worked a lot in the community. So all those stories and experiences of food are very much embedded in the rest of her everyday life. The Ambleside um, Oral History Archive has been going since around 1976 and it now has about 400 interviews. All the interviews are transcribed and they're all online and, and searchable. We decided to focus on childhood memories of the First World War. A number of elderly people were interviewed um, in the 70s and 80s and looking back to the First World War. So we also wanted to contrast the temporal frames that we were using. And what sort of thing would she have ready for you for lunch when you got in? Uh, we used to have plenty of good hot pot. We used to have sheep's head broth with plenty of vegetables. We even used to eat cow heels, big trotters, awful of all sorts. Stuff that people nowadays will throw out. The Ambleside archive is so rich, there are so many different interviews. There's a lot of detail about the different sorts of equipment that was used, for example, like uh, side ovens where, and, and sharing of, um, of ovens in the community. There's a lot around self-sufficiency, a lot about sharing food, growing oats in a, in a time when um, there was not much else. They were short of all sorts of things. So we do have a very clear picture of what people were doing at a particular time. Our third um, main data set that we've been looking at, we wanted to look at whether photography and ephemera could shed any more light uh, uh, about people's everyday food practices at that time. One of the books that we looked at actually at the British Library was a uh, cookery book which was particularly aimed at teenagers that was written in 1946. Um, and it's full of very glossy pictures, sort of portraying an ideal of family life as a teenager, holding tea parties for your friends. But it's also interesting for us to look at it because it, it tells us a lot about how foods were substituted with, with alternatives at a time when people couldn't get hold of certain items. The main premise or the background to this project was that food is a difficult thing to research. People do find it difficult to consciously reflect on their everyday routines. So what we have found by looking at this data is that when routines are disrupted, people are more likely to reflect on the everyday. Um, so methodologically, this has been really useful for us. Family Life and the Environment is a project which broadly is looking at meanings of environment in everyday family lives across contexts. So we're working with families in India and in the UK doing secondary analysis of data from families in India but also doing new data collection with families in both countries. We've been working particularly with the Young Lives study team in doing secondary analysis of data from just eight cases from their qualitative subsample, which is really interesting because Young Lives as a whole includes 12,000 families. So to take just eight within that and really look at them with a zoom lens focus on what's going on within those families' accounts has been, been a really interesting piece of work for us and for them, I think. We looked very closely at the Young Lives methodology in order to think about how to design our own work 
but then we took those ideas to India and spent a very intensive period piloting there, working with the Indian research team to develop a methodology for field work there, which we then took back and applied to the UK context. One of the things that we have done is a walking interview with a parent and child, a parent or carer and child together, which is based on a mapping exercise that we have the family group do in the first interview. So you see some of the places on the map, you also see places that they haven't put on the map, but which they're prompted to think about as they're walking. And that's one of the things that is very helpful with that multi-method approach in capturing the habitual and the quotidian, because it's, it's what you do without thinking about it. That's also what makes it so interesting to research, because in a sense, the everyday is everything, and that's what we live but equally that makes it quite hard to capture. We're learning how different aspects of the environment can be experienced as precarious. And for some families that's very much rooted in the everyday. So that might be something like fuel poverty, but even for some of our relatively more affluent families, it could be something like a major industrial development that they don't have any control over. For other families, understandings of precarity in the environment are much more distant, are tied to global environmental concerns about climate change. And for some of those families, that's very much seen as a threat to their everyday life. It's seen as their problem. For other families, it's very much seen as a concern for the other. So they might be concerned for somebody else, but it's not about it affecting them. And in some cases, that's that's making the proximal more distant because you could be living in an area where people are affected by floods but you're not personally and so you don't see it as affecting you. We think along with other researchers in the field that policy around environmentalism and climate change doesn't capture the complexity of what environment means in everyday life. By working from families' own constructions of meaning what we're trying to do is to unearth that complexity and the way in which that complexity is situated in social and cultural contexts. When we talk about work between Global North and Global South, we often talk in terms of development and the Global North educating Global South countries. And so we're trying to turn that on its head a bit and see what the, by putting these two very contrasting country cases alongside each other, what you can learn not from comparison, but by holding them in conversation with each other. The project was called Possibilities of Power Data. Uh, and what power data are, are byproducts of social research. And we were particularly interested in the byproducts of a survey called Poverty in the UK which was carried out uh, in the field in 1967 to 68. The uh, field workers uh, went out with paper booklets um, and knocked on doors and spoke to people and some of them made notes in the margins about what people had said, what housing conditions were like and so on. And it was those paradata that we were interested in looking at to see if we could understand anything about the survey process that might hold some lessons for contemporary surveys. The Poverty in the UK survey booklets were held at the UK Data Archive at the University of Essex. From this whole pile of 3,500 odd booklets, we selected out 69 booklets that had a lot of paradata written in them. We first subjected all 69 to a thematic analysis and then we selected out a further six booklets from those 69 to do in-depth narrative analysis because it's a very time-consuming process. There are lots of interesting uh, issues contained in the power data. One might be around expectations of families and, and uh, structures. So there was one particular interviewer. He acted like a very sceptical detective in, his, um, in conducting the interview. And you can see that from all the marginal notes. He was after the truth and he didn't believe this woman, what she was saying about the fact that she no longer lived with or saw her husband because she had a young child. 
And so he just assumed she must still be in contact with her husband, uh, who had, was said to have been gone for 12 years, because she had a child of seven. Um, so <laughs> that was that sort of, I don't think we'd assume that today. I think the stories about how the field workers responded to doing the interviews and their interviewees and the conditions that they lived in are really useful and interesting for today because what they show us is the skill and the humanity that is involved in collecting this statistical data. Recipes for Mothering is a small-scale pilot project which is a collaboration between researchers at the Novella Node and the Mode Node, which is also based at the Institute of Education. And we took the opportunity of researching food blogs to draw on our shared interests in food and food practices, mothering, narrative research and methods for understanding multimodally digital environments. We focused on two blogs. The Diary of a Frugal Family was very much focused on managing in times of economic scarcity, whereas the Thinly Spread blog was more about juggling um, limited temporal resources, a bit more about um, healthy food and responsible ethical living. We looked at everyday blogs over a period of six months and we did a thematic analysis of those. And then we took the About Me pages of the blogs as well and the narrative researchers on the project did a narrative analysis of those blogs to look at the kind of stated identity positions of the women bloggers. And we looked then at how those played out in terms of the everyday lives of them and their families. There were lots of interesting tips and advice um, recipes, for example, for making more out of less, ways of auditing one's kitchen before they went shopping. So actually things that we might, some might take for granted that might not be spoken about necessarily that were brought to light in the context of a blog that was shared, this kind of private women's work that often goes on unsaid. We were interested in how the, the written texts worked with the visual images as well. So we were particularly interested in blogging as a form of storying or, or performing motherhood through the medium of the blog. In some ways, um, similar to the ways in which recipes from the past have been read to reveal details about women's lives and, and their networks and then their priorities and so forth. We were looking to how we might read these kinds of more contemporary media to find out about women's lives. Something that was an important impact from our project was that working with the Mode team, we, um, we had the blogs archived by the UK Web Archive, which means that they'll be available and kept um, in perpetuity for future researchers to look back and find out what everyday life was like now. Given that there was so many blogs, there's millions of blogs out there, they seem to us to be a really important potential source of data but people haven't really known exactly how to work with them, we're just working that out. So this was a pilot project designed to think about what the potentials of the data were, what the constraints were and how we might work with them as researchers. One of the most interesting things about Novella um, is the range of projects and the range of the kinds of materials that have been gathered. Any single project on its own has been very interesting, but for me what has perhaps been the most innovative is actually putting these all together and saying that actually when you, when you think about the different historical periods, the different cultural contexts, the different kinds of materials, the, the archives, the diaries, the paradata, the interviews, the cameras, the maps, putting all of these together in the same room with people from different disciplines but all of whom share a narrative orientation to making sense of this. That to me is the most exciting part. That to me is where the innovation lies. Over the three years of the novella study we trained a range of different people in the methods that we were using and at the end of the project I certainly think that we've done a lot of different training courses and that people have gained a great deal from them and that we've also gained from them. So it hasn't been an us and them but capacity building for a whole range of people, including ourselves. And because we've done an awful lot of talking uh, about the projects in a number of different places, in a number of different countries, there already are 
people who are drawing on the novella approach. So from that point of view, it's already had an impact. What we very much hope is that people will have access to the ways in which we have done things, to be able to critique it, take it forward, build on it in much the same way that we have built on the work of so many exciting narrative scholars within Novella. Our hearts were empty as light.